How many of you remember the first time you saw a PlayStation 1 game? If you were a part of the era when the console was released, your jaw probably hit the floor when you first saw Ridge Racer or Tekken 2. These were very faithful arcade ports that Sony brought to the living rooms and bedrooms of gamers all around the world. If you experienced the system later on or indeed in recent times with the PlayStation Classic, you may be left wondering what was all the fuss about. The PlayStation hardware was built from the ground up as a dedicated games machine and crucial to the architecture would be its 3D capabilities. And those capabilities were extremely fast, with the system capable of pushing many thousands of polygons around the screen any given second. But if you compare the PlayStation with the 3D of its biggest rival, the Nintendo 64, the graphics can look quite primitive. Even worse is the shimmering, wobbling and popping in and out of textures as the camera is moved around. This is notable in something like Metal Gear Solid. These effects, or side effects I should say, is a part of what gave the PlayStation 1 its charm. But what actually is going on here, and why does the Nintendo 64 exhibit no such issues, yet the PlayStation 1 seems to have this problem on every single game? The PlayStation 1 does excellent 3D and it was an absolute powerhouse when it came out, pushing many polygons per second extremely fast. But the PlayStation 1 has a unique and interesting look about it that is very easy to pick out in a crowd that you could just say, that looks like a PlayStation 1 game to me and you would probably be right. To explain this, we need to take a close look at the architecture of the PlayStation 1. At the heart of the system is the MIPS R3000A CPU. It's a 32-bit processor running at 33 MHz. As with almost every CPU out there, it has an ALU or arithmetic logic unit. What's missing, however, is an FPU or floating point unit. This is important and we'll come back to this later on. The PS1 has two coprocessors, COP0 and COP2. COP2 is for the GPU and that's the one that we are interested in. The GPU is responsible, of course, for the graphical output. The PS1 has a 1 megabyte frame buffer at a maximum of 1024 by 512 pixels. There's also a 2 kilobyte texture cache for speed. Also interesting is that the GPU's frame buffer is not directly accessible from the CPU at all. In other words, you can't directly draw into it. Rather, commands are sent to the CPU to place objects into the frame buffer. This is done with what's known as ordering tables. These tables tell the GPU how and where to draw each primitive, and they are then sent to the GPU in the order that you wish to draw the 3D scene. The GPU can draw triangles, rectangles, lines, points and sprites. Textures can also be applied to polygons and sprites. There's also different color modes. And this is all pretty standard stuff for a 90s 3D GPU. But what's interesting about the PS1 is that there is another custom chip that is the heart of all 3D calculations that is known as the GTE or Geometry Transformation Engine. This engine is used for fast vector mathematics to handle rotation, translation, perspective and more. Of course, a CPU can handle this for you, but even with the most optimized code, this is the main job of the GTE and will perform these operations much faster. In fact, the GTE can manage on average 360,000 flat shaded polygons per second. The PlayStation 1 has three main limitations when it comes to graphics. No MIP mapping, no Z buffer, and no floating point numbers. Let's take a look at each of these. MIP mapping is a technique where a single texture is scaled and filtered at different resolutions. These are pre-calculated sequences that help eliminate alias effects and also increase performance because these MIP maps are generally cached. The downside of MIP mapping is textures at low resolutions appear blurrier. The Nintendo 64 has MIP mapping enabled, for example, in these scenes in perfect dark, but sometimes the Nintendo 64 gets criticized for appearing too blurry, and this is one of the reasons why. On the flip side, on a standard CRT, even with a composite signal, the PlayStation 1 could look very good with a very crisp and nice looking signal. The downside, of course, is that on a modern HDTV, a PS1 3D game does not look very good. It looks very pixelated, and upscaling and other things don't always help. But lack of MIP mapping isn't the reason why textures warp around. There are still some things to cover. A Z or Z buffer is an important part of any 3D graphics hardware, and it was left out of the PlayStation 1. To best explain a Z buffer, think of a painting or a drawing. An artist is attempting to recreate a 3D scene on a 2D plane, like a canvas or a piece of paper. 
Typically the sky, horizon and background objects in the distance are drawn first, followed by closer objects and then followed by the closest ones. That way the illusion of perspective is maintained. But in order to make things look realistic, the hidden surfaces must not be filled in. In a 3D world, we have X and Y coordinates to determine placement, but the Z or Z coordinate is used for depth, or in other words, how far from the camera the object is being placed. The Z buffer manages the depth of every single object in the scene and essentially solves this hidden surface problem for you. On the PlayStation, the GPU lacks a Z buffer, so no depth or Z information is ever passed to the GPU, and there is no way in hardware to do proper hidden surface removal. As an example of lack of Z buffer, let's consider the original tech demo, the T-Rex, that stunned developers with the power of the PlayStation. If we take a closer look at the animation of the T-Rex, everything is rendering correctly with the triangles furthest away from the camera, hidden by the body of the T-Rex that's closer to the camera. So, we just said that the PlayStation has no Z buffer in hardware, so how is this possible? Well, it doesn't mean that one can't be built in software, and that's one of the complexities for the developer. Essentially, triangles need to be sent to the PlayStation GPU in order of depth, with the ones furthest away being sent first all the way to the nearest ones. The hardware will still render it for you and hide polygons that are furthest away. So what exactly is the problem here? And why can't the developer just sort the triangles in correct order and pass them to the GPU? Well, that's exactly what most developers did when they developed games for the PlayStation. The problem here is, is that textures need to be applied to each polygon, which rely on accurate depth values. Because no depth values are sent to the GPU, textures are applied with what's known as a fine texture mapping. The edges of the polygons are correct, but the textured scan lines drawn between the edges to fill them don't calculate perspective. Each texture element or texel are the same size, and the result is this. A way to improve this was to break the polygon up into smaller triangles, but this may mean lots of processing is done on non-essential parts of the scene, like room models, floors and ceilings. With less triangles, generally in floor textures like racing games, they may generally be larger in size, and that's why you see more warping in the floor on many games. The Nintendo 64 has proper perspective calculation and a Z buffer. It also has mip mapping and as you can see with the comparison with Mega Man 64 and Mega Man Legends on the PS1, the wall textures on the PS1 show signs of warping due to the affine texture mapping. On the Nintendo 64 the perspective calculation is accurate. There's also other issues due to the lack of Z buffer. If we consider these three rectangles and trying to render them without a Z buffer, which rectangle is closest to the camera and which ones are hidden? Once again, a solution may be to break these rectangles into much smaller triangles and hide them, but this comes at a cost. It also is not entirely accurate. Back to the T-Rex demo, as we see the dinosaur walking, you can see the textures popping in and out at the hind legs. This is because of the lack of Z buffer. It's left up to the programmer to determine which triangle gets displayed and which one does not. There's also the phenomenon where polygons would jitter around for no apparent reason. This is another side effect of the PlayStation 1 hardware. Remember we mentioned earlier that the PlayStation does not support floating point values. This is the root cause. The PlayStation uses fixed point integers. Essentially this means that the vector calculations that are needed to rotate, translate and calculate new values was integer only. The GTE only ever outputs results as integer pixel coordinates without any fractional portion. The PlayStation cannot display any sub-pixel movements, and the polygons would just snap into place until one of its vertices moves enough to snap into a different pixel. This is the dreaded wobble effect that you see on many games, and is a part of the fabric that makes up the PlayStation 1. But as 3D hardware is much more powerful these days, advances in PlayStation 1 emulators means we are able to patch and fix these issues with Z buffer and subpixel movements to remove the warping and wobble of polygons. These are simple emulation options that can be applied, and in many ways, this makes the games much different than how they used to be. It's fair to say that these issues would have driven programmers mad, having to develop sorting algorithms, determine the number of triangles to use, how to reduce warping and wobble, it wouldn't have been fun. But these days, people seem to embrace the PlayStation 1 graphical style, calling it retro, and it's something that you can download and use shaders that accurately will reproduce PlayStation 1 style effects on engines like Unity. And I personally wouldn't have it any other way. 
The PlayStation 1 with its quirks, the wobble, the warping, all these issues remind me of the golden age of video games in the mid to late 90s, where games were starting to mature, arcades were becoming very popular, and 3D on home consoles were just getting started. It's really hard to know why Sony omitted these features from the graphics hardware on the Sony PlayStation. I think if I was to guess, it's probably to cut some costs on the retail price of the system. It wanted to be very competitive with the Sega Saturn and the 3DO, and obviously it completely destroyed the competition. But additional hardware features that get added to 3D chips and the architecture end up costing more money, end up costing more R&D money, and ultimately would increase the cost of the system. So I think maybe they felt like these features could have been left out in order to keep the cost to where it was at 299 US dollars. But of course I am speculating, I really don't know why those things were left out and if someone that is more affiliated with Sony at the time has a better understanding of why, I would love to hear the reasoning for you know, some of the omissions that were made. But of course it was also you know, early 3D and we were still kind of feeling our way around you know, hardware 3D acceleration with the earliest 3D FX cards that came out. There were emissions in those cards as well that, you know, had similar types of issues, but it did have a Z buffer. I know that for a fact. It definitely had a Z buffer, but there was, you know, the, the texture warping stuff that was going on in, in some instances as well that I certainly recall. So who knows, maybe it was just, you know, the you know, the immaturity, I guess, or the early days of 3D acceleration that was something that, you know, hardware manufacturers and architects were trying to figure out as they were learning about 3D and all the different ways to get good 3D on, you know, a game console or a PC. Well, guys, we're going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.